It's the morning after last night's huge game between France and Ireland away in Marseille and a statement has been made from the Irish. Many people were back in France, including myself. I thought France were going to come away with a fine margin uh, victory. But the Irish really turned up and really reminded us all why they were the favourites or one of the favourites to win the World Cup, why they were number one in the world before the World Cup. And uh, they've just you know, put in a gentle reminder or not so gentle if you consider the physicality of the Irish team in that game as to why they are, they're not to be messed with. And even away from home, they can put in some brilliant, brilliant performances. I think it's kind of unique the fact that the Irish went out of the World Cup in France and now they have the opportunity to go back to France in the opening round of the Six Nations, play a world-class team and a real, really make a statement. And uh, to say they did that is probably an understatement. Obviously, the, the elephant in the room is the red card that France received. Now, they could have had two, both from the same player. Uh, please do let me know in the comment section down below what your thoughts are on the game as a whole, but also the, the yellow card and the, the red card for Paul Valencia. Um, ultimately, it did have a big impact on the game, but even before that, the Irish were looking really, really strong. The selection choices from, from Andy Farrell, obviously in the 10 jersey with Jack Crowley, uh, you can't really tell a huge difference between the Irish machine uh, with or without Sexton when Jack Crowley stepped up. Uh, There's quite a bit of debate about who gets that 10 jersey. Do you go with the Munster fly half in Crowley or do you look to Leinster? Uh, as Leinster a huge powerhouse behind Irish rugby, but Jack Crowley really stepped up. His kicking was phenomenal. You know, as a number 10 going away to, to France, it's often a difficult place to go and kick, but he nailed all of his kicks bar one. And it's funny, the, weird, the one that he, the missed, that he missed was the easiest kick, sort of 33, 34 metres out, dead in front of the posts. He pulled it to the right, but the ones from the touchline, he was getting them straight down the middle and they never looked like missing. So unbelievably good stuff from the Irish. Uh, I don't know whether it was just me, but I felt like the atmosphere at the start of the game was maybe we've set some really high expectations for the World Cup, but I didn't quite feel like it hit the same sort of levels. You really could tell the Irish fans got into the game as it progressed, especially into that second half uh, when the tries really started to come for, for Ireland. So, yeah, I don't know whether that was just me. Maybe I didn't have my TV turned up loud enough, but if you're lucky enough to be at the game, let me know what the atmosphere was like and how it would sort of compare to the, the Ireland versus South Africa game in the World Cup, uh, for, for an example. But uh, yeah, very physical start. Both teams were really going for it. Uh, a little bit cagey, a couple of knock-ons and, and opting to go to the boot. Uh, Ireland's strategy from, from the boot of James Lowe was to keep the ball infield. So they clearly wanted to move that really big forward pack of France around. And I think you can see from the tries that Ireland scored, uh, the, the movement and the fatigue that they, that they implemented into the French forward pack created some really quite big spaces. Obviously, there's more space than usual with the red card and the yellow card in the game. But the Irish really... Found, uh, found spaces in the French defence probably easier than we would have expected. If we just talk through uh, the tries. First try came from Jameson Gibson Park. Some really good Irish attack. Uh, personally, I think the Irish are one of the best teams to watch in terms of attacking play. Their ability to retain possession is just phenomenal. We saw that in, the, in their loss to New Zealand. The last phase, or sort of the last phases of play lasted around 20, 30 phases in the dying moments of that game. Which shows their ability to resource rucks against quality opposition and through doing this in this game they just really stretched and stressed that French defence. Uh, when you look at the, the mobility of the French four pack in comparison to Ireland you'd probably favour or definitely favour the Irish uh, mobility. You had some massive lumps in there with Paul Valimsa and uh, Palosso Tuolangi when he came off of the bench for France. Now these are huge huge men and if you're running straight into them you're going to get smoked but if you can you know use subtleties of hand and if you look at Tyke Bird's Ty Burns, uh, Burns, sorry, Ty Burns line for his try, uh, beautiful line cut and for a, a second row to be playing like that, it's almost like having another back rower on your team which is really quite special. Uh, but for the Gibson Park try, uh, it came off of a, a Bundyaki offload and really flooded the, the inside channels really, really nicely. Uh, all good scrum halves do that follow up line through the middle and Gibson Park in this game was real, real test match quality, world class quality. And if you take Antoine Dupont out of the picture, uh, I think you could say you've got a very good shout for Gibson Park being the number one nine in the world. I've mentioned Ty Burns try, a beautiful line from him. Uh, real, real tested the Irish, sorry, the French defence over so many phases. And then it was the subtlety of the pass of Jack Crowley to see the eyes of, I think it was Jonathan Dante, go out the back, easy, pop, pop pass through the middle. And uh, it's very simple from the Irish, but they've got such complex structures, it creates real difficult pictures. Uh, for, for, the, for the French to defend and it was only a simple pass 
that, that was all that was necessary uh, for Tyburn to go crashing over. And then the other tries for Ireland came from Nash, Sheehan and Kelleher, all second half tries, um, some really good tries in there. Once again, going through multi-phase, Nash, who didn't have a huge uh, role in the game, definitely not as much as his uh, other winger, uh, James Lowe, but Nash took his try well, and for a debutant, I believe he is, uh, he did very, very, very well. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to, to play at the top level on your first game and, and not look out of depth, but I didn't think he looked out of depth. I thought he did the basics really well. And when you're looking at someone that's come into a team sort of fresh and new, all you want them to do is fit in, don't try and do anything special, and he did exactly that and finished his try quite nicely. Now, it's uh, very rare that you see an Irish performance that doesn't have a Maul try or at least a Dan Sheehan try, and uh, he got over in the second half, followed by Kelleher. Uh, the Irish Maul was really, really strong and uh, prevailed in the latter stages of the game. It did feel slightly like France lost a bit of hope uh, towards the end of the game. They came out firing very well in the second half, uh, in the first bit of the second half, but towards the end, especially when they had their, their last attack, sort of five metres out from the Irish line, they, they, they didn't really want it. They were sort of defeated at that point. Um, but the Irish took their tries very well late on. Penno crossed at the dying stages of the first half that kept the Irish, kept the French in the game, sorry. Uh, this was a slightly frustrating slash worrying moment for the, for the, uh, for the Irish. Uh, you don't want to let France get a sniff in a game like this. They've got such dangerous outside backs. So when I looked at the half-time score, I thought it should have been more in, in Ireland's favour. Um, sort of 17-8, 17-5 would have been more reflective of the dominance they had in that uh, first half. But to only go up seven points ahead, obviously Ireland would have taken that at the start of the game because they were the underdogs. But when you actually look at the quality that was um, shown in the first half, the majority came from Ireland. And then the second uh, French try came in the second half uh, from short range. Those went to the TMO, there was a lot of controversy. Uh, it's one of those where if it's on-field try, it'll stick as on-field try, which is exactly what happened. Uh, but if it was given as, you know, the referee says, I don't have an on-field decision, please tell me, then it most probably wouldn't have been a try. It looked like the ball was grounded short and then sort of pulled over. Um, but me personally, I don't mind which way that goes. That's a try or it's not a try. You can't really complain. Nothing massively definitive. Um, but that was the last score from the French. Um, both Ramos and Crowley did miss kicks at goal, so there were a few points left out there, but none of which would have made a difference on the match. Just to run through a couple of things that I thought both teams did uh, well and not so well, just go through uh, Ireland first of all. I've mentioned their multi-phase attack. It really is a really, really is a difficult proposition for the defence to, to try and cope with. So many different options for the ball carrier to pass to, and uh, the ability for the Irish to then latch onto the player that's ball carrying, and get them over the advantage line, and then create quick ball for the next phase is uh, quite phenomenal. And then James Lowe's boot. I mean, this player can kick a ball uh, to the moon and back multiple times. Uh, the ability to kick that ball from inside his 22 and get it past the opponent's 10 meter line is just ridiculous. Uh, he had one which he sort of shanked off the outside of his boot um, and that wasn't particularly great, but the rest of them were phenomenal. And uh, as a fly half, I've played a bit of fly half myself. It's so nice when you've got another player with, preferably uh, if you're a right footer, get a player that's got a left-footed boot uh, to kick to touch. It really does provide two options that the defence then have to try and charge down. Takes the pressure off of one player. It means Gibson Park doesn't have to box kick as much and uh, deal with the pressure of charge downs. So he's a real vital asset to that Irish team. And then I, one thing I did, didn't mention about Jack Crowley was obviously he had a lot of pressure on him going into the game. I thought his kicking to touch is a real reflection of your, your confidence going into the game. Uh, Jack Crowley, he, was, he wasn't being conservative. He was really trying to push the boundaries uh, when kicking to touch. Uh, it's very easy as a fly half just to you know, take five, 10 meters and not go for the corner flag because you're worried, you know, what if it goes dead? But he showed no sort of nerves in that, in that respect. He, he kicked the touch very well, far better than Jalibert. Uh, Jalibert was sort of hooking them into touch, not being ambitious, even when France were chasing the game. So massive props to Jack Crowley. Not only off the tee was he phenomenal, but kicking to touch as well. Uh, it's one of my pet peeves when fly halves just don't really go for the, for the five meter line when they're well within their means to do so. Uh, Jali Bear a couple times, he was literally stood on the five meter line, yet kicked it almost backwards a few meters. Now, there's a massive difference between the line out five meters out and eight meters out. Those last few meters are just vital for trying to score a try. So, um, Bear played to, to Crowley and Jali Bear, maybe he's got to look into that because it didn't help the French. 
Uh, Jameson Gibson Park, standout performer for me, was uh, was really quite quality in that game. Uh, everything stems from him, not only his kicking, but his running game. For such a um, a small player, he really takes the ball to a lot to the line and doesn't mind getting you know clunked a few times. Uh, and he's very difficult to defend. The speed of ball, uh, he's real quality uh, quality scrum half. And then Tyburn has another player that I thought played incredibly incredibly well. Um, there's loads of brilliant Irish performances that I'm missing out here. I haven't even mentioned the man of the match yet. So that just proves how phenomenal uh, the Irish team were and uh, how they performed last night. But Tyburn at line out time, not only did he score his uh, brilliant try from sort of 15, 20 meters out, uh, he was he was colossal in that line out, stolen line out ball, retained line out ball, and uh, really disrupted the, the Malvaca throw and uh, was a great source of turnover ball for the Irish. Now, the one downside for the Irish, I felt, their scrum got turned over a few too many times for Andy Farrell's liking, uh, and that was a massive strength for the French. And if if if, if, the, if the French were going to get into the game and close the scoreline down to a one-score margin, you'd say the scrum was probably the vehicle to do so. And uh, the French did dominate in that area, I would say. Maybe not dominate, but they had masses of success, but they didn't manage to make that tell. And the, the Irish, as soon as they conceded the scrum penalty, instead of then going and conceding another penalty or missing tackles, they then backed it up with something positive, which is all you can ask. You know, If you're going to give away a penalty, make sure the next action and the next impact you have on the game is positive. And you know, that way you'll, um, you'll avoid sort of conceding uh, multiple, multiple points. And then the driving mall for the French was well, good for the Irish as well, actually. I don't think either team had massively successful mall defence, um, but... But the, the French driving was was good. I thought they uh, got some good inroads into the Irish um, uh, sort of try try line uh, with their driving mall. They obviously got the yellow card from the driving mall where Peter Romani was forced to collapse it. I mean, I never really know what's happening there. You see a, a mass masses of players just fall on top of each other. It's very difficult to know if you know which players pulled it down or whether it's just sort of gone off balance. Uh, I don't really argue with it because you know I'm not one to to comment. If the ref seen something, just fair enough. Um, but yeah, the French driving mall was something to um, to take positives from. And then going on to the negatives. Now, I don't like criticising a team when they've uh, when they've obviously had a, a tough, tough loss at home. But I will ha I'm going to have to do it anyway. Uh, the forward fitness and mobility I thought was really poor. I often saw sort of French players coming back from offside positions, not being set in the defensive line, ready to go. I think it was a, a conscious decision to not pick players like Wocky and bring in players like Valencia to add more power into the team. But I really did think that was counterintuitive. And I thought uh, the lack of fitness really did catch up with them. And not only fitness, just the mobility, the speed to fold around a breakdown and, and to, be, to, to match the opposing numbers to stop overlaps, I thought was quite poor. Uh, discipline from, from the French. Jack Rowley had many opportunities to, to kick to the corner or take the three points. Uh, the French... Sort of the reason that they were conceding so many penalties was probably down to the fact that they weren't set in the defensive line and were in awful positions to then go and try and defend. So it leads to giving away things like not rolling away because you're you're stretched as a defence or a high tackle because you're having to cover for someone that's not already there. These things have massive impacts um, not only on the the next the next player but the next player and then the next player and sort of creates a negative chain of events. And uh, that links into my last point for the French, was the defensive spacing. I think because they weren't getting into line as quickly as they should be, the, the gaps were there. And with a quality fly-off like Jack Crowley and quality players like Ty Burn running those lines, it's um, very difficult to stop. And that was one of the main reasons why Dante was left in no man's land for the uh, Ty Burn try, because he was split between does he, does he jam in or does he go to the, to the player folding around the corner. He picked the wrong player and uh, could have done with some help with somebody else in the defensive line with him. But that was the tail of the tape in terms of rugby action. In terms of the not so nice things to see, the red card and yellow card, both could have been reds in my opinion. Uh, I think it's difficult because whether I think it, whether I think it's a red or not, I'm saying it's red based upon the, the, out, the outlines of the laws that World Rugby presented. Some people think these are too severe, but we have to go off the law book. And uh, I do think the second uh, card was a red card. There was a slight change in height, but it was, Philipsa was just so out of control, um, sort of flailing limbs and just was reckless. So Philipsa was lucky to escape with a yellow card off of the first red card. Uh, I'm not saying it's a definite red card, but it could have been a red card. And then the second one, 
I mean, you're pushing a hill up already, and it was he was sent off from a, a double yellow anyway. So um, it wasn't like the French were down to 13 men. It was just two separate uh, occasions. So yeah, that is the game wrapped up. Uh, please do let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Congratulations to all the Irish fans out there. I'm sure this one feels extra sweet considering the the World Cup quarterfinal turmoil. So uh, fair play to you guys. Uh, you've really turned over a quality team in the French. Uh, in the in the blue of France and uh, come out with a 21 point victory statement made grand slam is on for for Ireland and uh, the rebuild for France will have to uh, will have to uh, be given some attention by the coach and staff but uh, yeah let me know your thoughts on the game in the comment section down below I'll reply to you all as always and uh, yeah take care and also please do wish me luck for the England uh, versus Italy game in a couple of hours I'm a little bit nervous for that one rather mixed up English team against uh, an Italy team that's been building for many years so fingers crossed I'm sort of you know over stressing as opposed to uh, and uh, maybe I'm underestimating the English team but who knows but uh, yeah thank you very much for watching